Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Julie, for handing that over to me. So, um, yes, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Penny Kasler. I'm from the Communication and Engagement Unit with the South Australian Country Fire Service. And as Julie said, I've been putting, um, doing these presentations with Julie and Horse SA now for a couple of years. So this is a general presentation on how to prepare your horse property. Um, and, but I'd strongly encourage you to go to our website and type in horses and bushfires fact sheet uh, in the search bar and that will take you through to our five page fact sheet which has got a lot of information on it which supports um, and, in, and is in addition to what I'm going to go through today. Alright, so I'll get started on my presentation then. Um, so basically what we're going to cover today is some information about bushfire behaviour, what the fire danger ratings are and what they mean, um, and also how to prepare your property. That's a, a photo there of Julie's horse, just an example of um, one way you can mark your horse if it's going to be a bad fire day and you want to open all your internal gates uh, and leave your horses roaming internally, um, that's a just in case to put your, uh, put your in phone number on the horse there. Alright, so our volunteers here attend about 1,200 bushfires every season. Um, in fact, that number has been quite elevated the last couple of years and been more around the 2,000 um, mark. A lot of that's been because of extra lightning activity that we've had. Um, we're actually um, in a situation in South Australia here where you know we get wet winters so that all the fuel grows and then we get hot, dry summers. Um, most of our fires do occur in that fire season around the, you know, either side of Christmas, um, but we have had bad fires right up until May and as early as September. So, um, you know, just be aware that uh, the fire season, you know, doesn't officially stop and start and just occur around that Christmas period. Um, we're in one of the most high risk areas for bushfires in the world. I'll just pause now while you all say, oh yay. Thank you. Right. Um, the reason for that is because of that climate, so those those hot, um, dry summers, but also the the hills. So the topography has a big impact on fire behaviour. Um, a fire going along a flat area at eight kilometres an hour, if it gets to a steep hill, like you might see in um, the back of uh, Hobart or through the Adelaide Hills or in the Victorian high country, um, that eight kilometre an hour flat fire is going to turn into a 32 kilometre an hour fire up a hill. So um, just be aware of that, that, that hills make a big impact on fire behaviour. And of course, um, we've got a lot of fuel here that, that burns well um, and we'll talk about fuel in a minute a bit more. Um, locally here in South Australia, each brigade attends about 20 fires in their local area each fire season. So in terms of your personal risk, um, you know, that's about 20 times a year that, you know, you could be faced with a fire. Um, of course, the Samson Flat Fire was a very large event here earlier this year, but uh, a lot of these fires um, are over and done within half an hour or so and only affect a small area, um, but we need you to look out for those fires because it could be your property where the lightning strikes. Um, all fires need fuel to burn and you should manage the fuel around not only your home but also your horse yards, um, your stables, any areas that are important to your horses as well. We would recommend that you have a low graze paddock around the house and that you move stock into that lowly graze paddock. Um, on days which are total fire ban days. That not only protects the stock but it also protects your house as well. Um, so I guess I just want you to have a think about what kinds of flammable plants are there around your property at the moment. Um, the pony in that photo is my little Dexter, nine hand high Shetland. Um, He's probably one of the few horses um, that I know that I probably could put in the back seat if I had to and drive off with him. Um, but we'd like you to have a think about at the moment what trees have you got around your place. Um, I think virtually in all the, all the states of Australia we're going to find um, gum trees, pine trees, wild olive trees and olive groves. But think about what's in your garden as well. Um, lavender. Lavender is a real problem in gardens. It's a very flammable plant. Um, pretty much you'll notice all of those plants there have got a high oil content. 
So just think about any oily plants that you have in your garden and lavender is one of those things that people often forget about but it, it can often be planted quite close to the house. Um, I guess just thinking about the weather, what makes a high risk day. Again, um, those of you in southeastern Australia will be pretty familiar with these factors. Um, high temperature, keep in mind it doesn't need to be 40 degrees. Um, some of our worst fires over here uh, or bad fires have been on days when it's just been in the high 20s or even low 30s. So don't look out for bad fires just on um, you know, days of, of 40 or around that. Um, low humidity, so absolutely no chance of raining. Um, any humidity under about 10 to 12% is of real concern to us. High wind speeds. Um, most often we get northwesterly winds here in South Australia, but quite regularly in early in the early to mid afternoon we'll get a cooler change, uh, and the change will come through with a southerly behind it. Um, the Eden Valley fire that happened in South Australia. February, sorry, January the 17th, 2014. The bulk of those properties impacted in that fire were impacted after the southerly change, so they were all hit from the south, um, and it wasn't an area that they'd necess necessarily prepared their properties to, you know, to get hit from. Um, dry cured fuel, obviously, um, there's only a risk when the fuel is actually dry. So. Um, what we do when those factors come together in the wrong way is that we will issue a total fire ban uh, day and we'll give it a rating. Um, so a fire danger rating, it's simply a weather forecast. Um, it's not a prediction that a fire is more likely to start on that day, but what it tells us is about fire behaviour. So we know that fires under hot, dry and windy conditions will become difficult, more and more difficult to control um, as the wind picks up more and more. So it, it's a prediction of fire behaviour, not the likelihood of a fire. What we would suggest you do is know what your fire ban district is. Um, so many of you will be in the Mount Lofty Ranges, for example. Some of you might be in the Mid-North or the Upper Air Peninsula or the York Peninsula, etc. We would suggest you know what your fire danger rating is for your district. So really listen out on the news um, in the evening or look at our website or go to the Bureau of Meteorology website and get that fire danger rating for your area. Link it to your plan. So you might say, under severe conditions I'm going to do X, Y and Z. Under extreme and catastrophic conditions I'm going to do A, B and C. Um, just remember under any conditions, however, that fires can threaten suddenly. Um, keep an eye out on those bad days and of course call triple zero if you do see a fire. Um, we've given some ideas about what you should be doing on those particular fire ban days. So under severe conditions we would expect that fires would be uh, moving pretty quickly but they'll be fairly easy for us to predict. Um, and for our um, very experienced and highly trained volunteers with all the right equipment, we should expect that they would be able to get on top of those fires in a reasonable time frame. Um, your house is prepared to, uh, sorry, your house is built to withstand a fire under those conditions. Um, when you chunk up to the next fire danger rating, extreme, um, we would recommend that you actually leave early on those days. Um, you need to have all the right equipment, you need to have a practised plan, you need to have the right clothing to wear, you need to be physically fit, you need to be emotionally prepared. There's quite a number of boxes that you need to tick if you are going to stay and defend under those conditions. Um, your house is not designed to, build, uh, to uh, withstand a fire under those conditions. Um, and just for the record, the Samson flat fire, even though it was forecasted as going to be catastrophic that day, it was um, mostly in the extreme range. So most of that fire that people experienced was, was an extreme fire. So that gives you an example of fire behaviour under those extreme conditions. Um, catastrophic, all the rules go out the book. We will not be able to work out which houses are going to survive and which won't. Um, the fire will chop and change direction very quickly and very erratically. 
um, it will be very difficult for anybody, including uh, volunteer firefighters, to get on top of that fire. Um, it's going to be very fast moving. Uh, Catastrophic conditions were present in the Canberra fires in 2003, Ash Wednesday in 83, Black Saturday in 2009, uh, Wongaree in 2005. So they're the kind of fires that we would expect to see on those days under catastrophic conditions. Um, we would definitely suggest that you move yourself and your horses out of the area before a fire starts under those conditions. and. I would even consider it under extreme conditions, given that to relocate a horse is quite a difficult thing to do compared to your, you know, your cats and dogs and birds and things. Um, just before I go off that slide, I just want to talk to you about ember travel as well. Um, embers travel well ahead of the fire and are generally carried by the wind. If you look in the, the middle of that, that table, you've got Sevius. Um, under those conditions, embers are going to be travelled travelling about a kilometre ahead of the fire front. Under extreme conditions, the next box up, you're looking at ember travel about 5 k's ahead of the fire front. And under catastrophic conditions, you're looking at ember travel up to 20 kilometres ahead of the fire front. So you're suddenly getting a picture of why we're concerned on those extreme and catastrophic rated days, because a fire that is a fair distance away could suddenly um, be be upon you because um, of that ember travel. Um, so this is my famous burning bananas picture. Um, the picture here is not of burning bananas. Somebody did say that's what they look like. That's just an example of the embers being lifted up and dropped down in front of the fire front. And you can um, you can see in that photo that the ember travel is probably only you know 50 or 60 metres ahead of the fire. But as I said, keep in mind that that ember travel that we were just talking about. Um, houses burn down in three main ways. Firstly, because of direct flame contact if the fuel is too close to the home. Secondly, just because of radiant heat. So a large amount of radiant heat on a window, for example, can actually crack and break the window, allowing then embers to get in. Um, but the main reason why houses burn down is actually just the little embers blowing around before, during and after the fire. So this next photo shows an example of embers that was taken out the window of one of the fiery vehicles in uh, during the Canberra fire. So that was that's also a photo of what it's like driving through a fire. So not a good place to be. You can see you know thousands of small little twigs and sticks and pine bark mulch and just airborne little embers, um, you know, pelting pelting their way through the air there. Um, this is just an example of a house that burnt down because of embers. Out the front you can just make out the green grass and there's a couple of patches of green closer to the house. Um, embers blew straight in under an exposed decking there and set that house on fire and burnt the whole thing down unfortunately. Uh, now for those of you who are listening to this um, and not seeing the slides, I've got a slide now of a decking um, and on the decking there was something there that caught on fire and set the, the decking on fire. Um, for those of you who can see it, um, that's what's left of somebody's core doormat. So a core doormat was sitting there, little twigs and sticks that were alight landed, landed on it and after a few minutes set it on fire and set the house on fire. Um, the next one is what's left of somebody's mop. So they'd mop the floor that morning, they'd left the mop leaning up against the back of the house, it was a bit damp, um, the embers came in, dried out the mop, set the mop on fire, set the house on fire. So the moral of the story of that one, of that one is that um, during summer don't mop your floors. Alright, and the final one showing ember attack, um, there's a handrail there where there were some towels left drying on the handrail. Again, embers came in and landed on the towel, set the towel on fire, set the handrail on fire and set the house on fire. So when you're looking at fuel around your home, think about anything flammable. So it could be the dog's bed, could be a set of boots on the decking, um, could be an outdoor furniture setting, uh, a pot plant, anything like that where embers could get trapped. 
So we can't stop the fires from happening. What you can do is prepare for them. Um, for those of you who um, remember back to Scouts or your primary school days, you, you remember that all fires need heat, oxygen and fuel. Um, you can't do anything about the heat or the oxygen. Unfortunately, you can't remove those, but what you can do is manage that fuel around your home. Um, I'll just draw your attention to that photo there from Catherine Zale, um, whose property was impacted by the Eden Valley fire. She left that horse in that very bare paddock. You can see that it's basically probably about an acre square of sand. Um, it's got trees all around it, but nothing flammable in the paddock at all, and her horse survived in that paddock. She left that one in there um, when the fire front came through. So in terms of preparing your house, um, think about reducing and managing the fuel around your, ho your home and your horse areas um, and ember-proofing your property as best you can. Anywhere that you can poke your little finger into your property is generally an area that embers could get in. So think about air conditioners, vent bricks, um, on your roof space, anywhere that you could poke your little finger in apart from then those those things that might trap embers like your, your dog's bed and, and uh, pot plants and things that I was referring to before. In terms of space around your house, we would recommend that you have nothing flammable within two metres of your home. That might mean moving things on total fire ban days. Um, creating breaks, so not having a continuous amount of fuel that starts out in the paddock and then goes through your garden around the house and then follows onto your decking and takes it right up to the house. Start having breaks between your fuel, so you may have a garden and then you might have some gravel and then you might have a pot plant or two and then you have your house. Look at managing your vegetation around your house within about 20 metres, so keeping things trimmed nice and low um, and, and keeping things away from the house and think about what's stored in your stables. Most people do have feed in their stables, I know I do, um, you know, so think about the flammables that you've got in your stables and whether you can move them on total fire ban days. Um, this is about ember proofing, so just stop embers from getting in to your home and your buildings if you can. Um, so sealing any gaps in your roof, vents, whirly gigs, stick your head up inside your manhole cover and see if your whirly gig in your ceiling has got a uh, metal fly wire um, to stop any embers from dropping into the ceiling space. Keep gutters clean, make sure you've got door seals. Um, and seal under the house if the house is elevated. Um, so this following slide shows a well-prepared home in a very rural setting. Um, there were a, a lot of trees around this home and they had left the trees. So this isn't about just going through with two tractors and a chain between them and chopping everything down. Um, it's actually about ember-proofing that box, that house that is sitting there. Um, so I'll go through to the slide. You can see on the outside of the, the fire ground there, the ash on the ground is very white. So it was a very hot fire. Uh, but you can see the the well-prepared home sitting right in the middle there. They did lose some open shedding out in their, uh, the areas near the caravan. Uh, that was three-sided sort of typical farm shedding that's quite open, but they've done some very good fireproof and ember proofing on that home. Um, if there is a big fire event going on like the Samson Flat Fire, um, count on getting no early warning. Um, count on having no mains water. So you need to have an independent water supply, preferably. Um, the electricity may well be damaged by the fire or may be switched off, so assume no electricity. Um, assume no fire crews. Uh, in, in none of the states in Australia have we got enough fire crews to get one to every house during a big event. So whilst we'd love to say we'll be there to help, the reality is we, you know, we probably won't be. So put, put your fire plan together on the basis of not having any help. Um, the water bombers are great, they are little planes, um, but they're not allowed to fly at night and they're not allowed to drop water if it's too windy. So um, there's, uh, you know, again, not a guarantee that you're going to have a plane nearby either. 
Um, and I guess that last stop point there, no one to tell you what to do, you really need to think about that one, especially for those of you who've got teenage children who might be home during a fire. Um, you know, everybody needs to know how to start the fire pump. Everybody needs to know how to put a halter on a horse and all of those things. Um, if you are going to be, you know, there during a fire or you, you might be stuck there during a fire, everybody needs to know what your plan is and how to to implement that plan. So a bushfire survival plan, we would recommend that everybody has one if they work or live in a bushfire prone area. One of the things we used to say was you should make a plan to either go early or stay and defend. Um, we would now suggest that you actually have both a plan to stay early, uh, sorry, to stay and defend or leave early because what we know from Black Saturday in Victoria was that people just had one plan and they were forced into doing the opposite and didn't know what to do. So people had gone shopping um, when the fire started and they were in a leave early plan. They weren't allowed to go back. The roads were already shut. The fire was already impacting but they wanted to get home and turn on their sprinkler system and move their horses and take the horses' rugs off and all of those things that they'd written down on their plan. Um, likewise, some people had always intended to go if there was a fire, but they woke up in the middle of the night and realised it was already around them, so they had to stay. So then they suddenly started thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do? So put together a plan, test it, practice it with your family. Um, I will mow my paddock if there is a fire is not a well thought out plan and for those of you who are just listening to this, um, I've got a slide there of a chap using a push mower to mow his paddock and his paddock is about waist high grass and there is a bushfire in the background coming towards him. Um, way too late to be doing that kind of stuff. Um, so a leave early plan would consider some of the following things. Um, planning if you're going to relocate your horses or not, where you're going to take them, when you're going to take them. Um, organising that low fuel paddock um, within your property if necessary or maybe your neighbour's got a low fuel paddock that you could take your horses to on a total fire band day. Um, identifying your safe routes out from your property, identifying which horses are going to stay and which will go. Making sure everybody who's going can load well. Do you have a horse that hasn't been floated for 20 years and you're suddenly going to try and stick him in a float when, when there's a fire coming? Um, can a stranger easily handle your horse during the Samson flat fires um, before or when the fire was about 20 kilometres from my home? I got a call from my riding teacher saying, do you want me to go and get your horses? And I said, no, that's that's okay. Um, but I suddenly thought, wow, would my horses go on a float with someone that they weren't overly familiar with? Um, and the last one, you know, does your horse have any dietary needs? So, you know, is it allergic to wheat and hay? Um, we know from Victoria in 2009 that people who had a written and practiced bushfire survival plan generally fared much better than those who didn't. Um, and I've got a photo up there of some cars um, that had been impacted. Um, there had actually been some deaths in some of those cars in Victoria. Um, and in the background of that of that pile up is a horse float and a car. You know, are they leaving too late? Who's relying on you to make a good decision during a fire? Um, so getting you and your family prepared for bushfires um, isn't that hard and also we can help you. Um, we've got a, a program called Community Fire Safe. It is a free program where we come out to your home and help you to prepare your home and family against the impact of fire. Um, I believe that the other states have similar programs as well. I know in Victoria it's called Community Fire Guard. Um, so the way we run it, uh, we run it with a small group of residents who get together, we come out to their home and run a couple of sessions about how to put a bushfire survival plan together. We do a bit of a street walk and wander around the outside of the house and look at any um, local risks or ember entry points. Um, they're small informal groups, they're um, a good way to get to know your neighbours. We encourage people to swap phone numbers while they're there so that people know how to get in touch with each other in the event of an emergency. Um, so basically all we need is somebody to stick up their hand and say, yes, I'd like to run one of those groups and we do the rest. 
Um, so I'd encourage you all to go to the website of your local fire authority. Um, every state has a, a bushfire control um, authority and uh, excellent websites with all, lots and lots of information on there. Um, our website is on all of our brochures. Um, the address is www.cfs.sa.gov. Au. Um, and while you're there, if you uh, just a reminder to check out our horses and bushfires fact sheet because that's got a whole lot more information um, with a lot more detail than what I've been able to go through today. All right, so thank you everybody. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I would love to take any questions now if anyone's got any. <laughs>